You're listening to the Informal Bible Study, a casual and applicational look at the Scriptures. I'm John Stonge, and it's great to have you with us today. Before we take a look at our Scripture today, I'd like to invite you to stop by our website, which is DesireJesus.com. And on our website, you'll find links to our bookstore, links to both of our podcasts, our blog, and a link where you can sign up for our weekly newsletter. Each Tuesday, I send out a newsletter with a word of encouragement and some content to help you in your walk with Christ. And if you'd like to receive that each week in your inbox, it's free. All you need to do is just sign up on the website, desirejesus.com. You'll see the newsletter tab. Just click it, and we'll be happy to add you to the email list. Now let's take a look at today's scripture. This morning, we're in Romans chapter 16, and I want to mention something about this chapter before we even take a look at it together. We're in the last chapter of the book, so for a group of months, we've been looking at this book together, and uh, here in Romans 16, we're at a portion of Scripture that a lot of times, when if you're reading through the book of Romans, and I think most people do this, when they get to chapter 16, they breeze right through it. And I think one of the reasons why we tend to breeze right through this chapter is that you'll notice chunks of this chapter are lists of names. Now, did you ever come across a portion of Scripture like that where it's a list of names and you think, all right, what do I do with this? And what do we instinctively do with that? Read it real quick because it's a whole bunch of names that we can't pronounce anyway, right? You know, we just like breeze right through it and we're like, all right, we're done. I remember when I was growing up and I was in Sunday school class and our Sunday school teacher got sick and had to leave early. And so there was a fill-in that wasn't prepared, but she was someone who knew the Bible very well and she didn't know ahead of time she was going to be teaching that Sunday school class. We were like 12 and 13 years old and she came in and this was her approach. She said to the class, "Um, so I didn't know I was going to be teaching you guys today, but this is what we're going to do. She said, you tell me, what is the most boring part of the Bible to you? And one of the girls raised her hand, and she said, yeah, what, what is it? And, and her answer was, the begats. That's what she said, the begats. And I was like, what's the begats? I've heard of the Ten Commandments. I've heard of the Beatitudes. What's the begats? And I was waiting to find out, what's the begats? I was like, what is that? And she said, you know, where it says so-and-so begat so-and-so, who begat so-and-so. And I was like, oh, yeah, that is kind of boring. And so uh, our fill-in teacher said, great, let's open right up to that. And so she based her lesson off of that and, and, and did a good job. And while this portion of Scripture isn't a begat, begat, begat type of, uh, of Scripture, it's one of those Scriptures that lists a bunch of names, but I want you to notice something about this. It does more than just list names. It gives us a little glimpse into these people's lives and into their service and into how they join together. And one of the big things that I take away from this, when I look at this portion of Scripture, in fact, I I have to be honest with you, I was pretty excited to have the privilege to, to speak on this portion of Scripture today, partially because it gets skipped so often, but also because I actually find this portion of Scripture inspiring. So there are a lot of things that you can tell me in the world of theory that I might find interesting. But when you can tie that theory to someone's life that actually lived it out, I feel inspired. And so when I'm looking through this portion of Scripture, this is what I notice. I see a group of people who didn't waste their life, and they said, all right, we're going to do big things, but we're going to do it together. And so that's what we're talking about this morning, this idea, uh, this idea of doing the big things that the Lord calls us to do, but doing them together. So if you would take your Bibles and open up to Romans 16, we're in Romans 16, starting with verse 1, and this is what it states in that portion of Scripture. Romans 16, starting with verse 1, says this, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Centria, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints, and help her in whatever she may need from you, for she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Epinatus, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. 
Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Adronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my kinsman Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Greet Azencritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermas, and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philo... This one always trips me up. Greet Philologus. Philologus, all right? Philologus. I'm going to have to say it again in a little bit, so let me just get it straight in my head now. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful for the privilege to be able to look at this portion of your word today, a portion that is so often just skipped over, and yet there's a group of people here, Lord, that served you in a generation prior to ours that we can learn great things from. So Lord, we pray that as we take a look at this portion of Scripture, and as we think about this idea of doing big things but doing them together, we pray that we would be encouraged and inspired by the examples of the people that we see in this portion of your word. And Lord, we're grateful for the fact that there are others who have come before us that have given us this kind of an example. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you could see this from various portions of Scripture for sure, but you could also see it from some of the things that Paul mentions here in Romans. But Paul lived a very interesting life. He lived the kind of life that results in having a lot of great stories to be able to tell once you get to the end. And, you know, while in this world there are some people who observe others making changes and taking risks and and getting arrows shot at them, Paul was the kind of guy who wasn't content to just sit around and observe other people doing what needed to be done. Paul was the kind of guy who was compelled with the unction that the Holy Spirit supplies to boldly do what the Lord had called him to do. So you see in Paul's letters, descriptions of some of these things. You see throughout the book of Acts that that Luke wrote down, uh, where he describes in great detail many of Paul's ministry acts and things of that nature. You see those bold moments recorded in those portions of Scripture as Paul took risks to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to people who as of yet did not know Christ. Paul spent his life on this earth attempting big things. He experienced great successes. There are also portions of Scripture that you could look at the details where it tells us about great failures or setbacks that the Apostle Paul experienced, seasons of persecution, prison time, all sorts of things that he experienced and risked to be able to let the gospel be known, to make the gospel known to people who as of yet didn't know Christ. And I admire the things that the Lord used Paul to do. And I feel motivated when I look at a portion of Scripture like this that not only references Paul, but it also gives us examples of, you know, other people who submitted their lives over to the Lord and listened to the Lord's voice when he spoke. So you have Paul doing these things, but he's bringing people along with him. That was his pattern in ministry. You see this in the book of Acts. See this throughout his letters. He would do what the Lord called him to do, and he would invite people to join him in doing these things. They would partner together. He wasn't trying to to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to this world by himself. He partnered with men. He partnered with women. And they became his family in Christ to join in these tasks together. They served together. And now here we are a couple thousand years later as beneficiaries of their service and beneficiaries of the sacrifices that this group of people made. We know, think about this for a second, we know Jesus in part because people like this partnered together to make him known to us or to those who came before us. And their example has been emulated by millions of people throughout the centuries, including many of us. 
So we're getting to, our, to the end of our study of the book of Romans. We've been looking at this book since the month of September, and now we're getting to the end of our study. We have just today and then next week, and then we're finished looking at it. But I want to take a look at those he partnered with here in this portion of Scripture, and I hope that as we do this, we'll be inspired to do some big things together. I think that's one of the goals that, that we're to take from a portion of Scripture like this. And one of the things that this portion of Scripture teaches us by way of this example is this. Never be above serving somebody else. Never be above serving somebody else. Let me reread verses 1 and 2. There it speaks of Phoebe, and it says this, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Centria, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you. And then it makes this statement about her. It says, For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Now let me pause there for just a moment. Recently, I, I heard a story of a multimillionaire who apparently owns a lot of real estate. That's, that's where he's made a lot of his money, I guess. And he was walking with a group of guests through some sort of complex. I think it was an office complex that he owned, and it's relatively new, and he was showing this group of guests this office complex. And as he was walking through this complex, he started doing something that his guests noticed But nobody said anything to him about, and he didn't say anything about it either. He just was doing it. As he was walking through the complex with these guests, if he noticed a piece of trash here or there, he would just bend down, pick it up, crumble it up, throw it away, see something over there, you know, pick it up, straw wrap or whatever. He'd bend down, pick it up, and throw it away. He didn't page somebody to do it. He didn't, you know, call somebody with the title of, you know, like like rubbish removal or something like that to come and do it. He reached down and got it. And they were impressed by that because one of the things he was communicating was even though he owned this complex and even though he employed all these people, he wasn't above picking up a straw wrapper. He wasn't above doing something that others would say, oh, that should be beneath you at this point. You're a multimillionaire who built these structures and employs everybody here, but he wasn't above doing simple things like that. And I think it's a shame when people get to a season of life where Sometimes they, we can think that maybe we've, we've become like above serving others. And the way I hear it phrased is sometimes like this. Oh, I've done my time. Let somebody else do that now. Do you ever hear that? Like, I've done my time. Now that's somebody else's task. Or I pay people to do that so I don't have to, right? Do you ever, do you ever hear that statement? I pay people to do that, you know? And then you look at Phoebe, who's mentioned here in this portion of Scripture. Now, that's one of the names that have actually, that's actually survived is still commonly used from this chapter. So there's a few of them. My daughter, her name, Julia, is found in this chapter as well. So that's one that's survived. Um, you know, some of the others, not so much, right? But Phoebe, that's a name we still use in modern day. And Phoebe's mentioned here in these verses. And Paul tells us a few interesting things about her. She's referred to, first of all, as a servant of the church. So that's the way she's described in this passage, as a servant of the church. Now, I'll tell you a little secret. The word servant that's being used here, it's the same word that we transliterate as the word deacon. And actually, some translations actually refer to her not as the servant of the church, but as the deacon or deaconess Phoebe. It's the same word, right? Um, And Phoebe was somebody who had a heart for service. That's something that she was known for. She was known as one who had a heart for service. And the idea was this. When you look at what what, what Christ did when he came to this earth, Scripture makes it abundantly clear that when Jesus came to this earth, he took the form of a servant. Now, when he comes again, he's coming as king. But in his first coming, he took the form of a servant, and he came to humbly serve humanity. Even though he had created us, he now came to serve us. He took the form of of a servant, and here you have Phoebe basically saying with her life, if Jesus was willing to do this for me, I'm willing to do this for somebody else. She had a heart for service. She did not consider herself above serving others. She did this for Christ's glory, and she developed a reputation in that generation as an example of what it looks like to serve other people for Christ's glory. But Paul tells us something else about Phoebe. He tells us here that she was a patron of many, including himself. She was a patron of many, including himself. So it appears that the Lord had actually blessed Phoebe with wealth during the course of her earthly life. She was probably a wealthy person. Now, 
you don't have to say this, you don't have to answer this out loud, but I bet you I know the answer to this. Um, what do you think? Is that something that you'd be okay with if the Lord decided to bless you with wealth as well? Is that something you'd be like, yeah, I'd probably, I, you know, somehow I'd, I'd learn to accept it. If that is my lot in life, if the Lord decides to bless me with wealth like he blessed Phoebe. Well, years ago, not too long after my wife and I got married, I, I, uh, I realized, all right, I got to do something to improve our income. And I thought, what can I do? And one of the ideas I had was to buy an investment property. And so that's what I did. Even before we owned a home that we lived in, the first home we actually bought was an investment property. It was a foreclosed property up in the Poconos that needed some repair. And the idea was I was going to rent it out for people who came there on vacations. And the honest truth is it worked out great. We earned good income off of that investment property. We didn't know at first that that was going to work out great, but I remember when I was first working on it, a guy that lived across the street from it came over to talk to me and to find out what I was doing because the property hadn't been lived in for a year. And he's like, hey, what's going on over here? And I told him I had bought it as an investment and we were fixing it up so that we could rent it out. And then he started telling me a very interesting story. He said, hey, I got to tell you, you know, speaking of investment, speaking of trying to earn some money, he said, just so you know, I invented something, patented it, it's going to make me millions. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, brother. Because if that was true, do you really think like some guy would say that to some random guy? It's like, I should have said to him, how do you know I'm not going to rob you now, right? You don't know me, we're just meeting. Um, but the point being, I'm like, why is he saying this? So he's telling me all these stories about this, the, you know, the, the money that's going to come in from this thing that he invented and patented. And it's, I think it was something that was going to be used in the medical field. And he was, he was all impressed with himself. And he said, but he, he said, you know what I'm going to do for this community? That area over there, I'm going to develop that into a playground because I believe in giving back, you know? <laughs> and in my mind, I'm like, this is such a lie. This is so fake. This guy is lying, but I was polite and I listened to it and I was actually a little bit entertained by his story and it gave me a break from doing the landscaping that I was doing, right? But let me say this, what would you do if all of a sudden you had a large sum of money? Because here again it says, you know, it's talking about Phoebe and it's indicating that she was probably wealthy. So what would you do if you have a large sum of money? And by the way, I could tell you the answer already. Not because I have the gift of predicting the future, but I could tell you exactly what you would do. You know what you would do if you had a large sum of money? You would do the same things you already do. You would, right? So would I. We would do the same things we already do. And what I mean by that is this. Money doesn't change your heart. It might make what's already in your heart more visible, but it doesn't change what's actually going on in your heart. So if you're already someone who's generous, right? If you're already a giving person, if you're already meeting the needs of others, I think you'll just be more generous on a bigger scale. That would be my guess. And I think that if you're someone who's mostly focused on consumption and comfort, that that's what you would continue to focus on, but on a bigger scale. And when you look at what this tells us about Phoebe, I think that by her actions, you could actually see what was going on in her heart. She was clearly someone who was inspired by the Lord to be generous because she was a recipient of the generosity of the Lord. So she decided, as one who had been blessed with additional ways to do that, she decided, look, I'm going to, be, I'm going to bless others with my time. I'm assuming at this point, since she was wealthy, she probably didn't have to try and earn money in a variety of ways. She seems like she already had it. So she said, all right, since I already have money, I'm going to now use my time to do what? serve others, right? She's serving. She's generous with her time. She's generous with her energy. And she was apparently generous with her resources, being the patron of Paul, being the patron of many uh, who were trying to bring the gospel to others. So she rejoiced in her faith in the Lord. She was grateful for his service to her and the blessings that he had bestowed upon her. And she was touched to go and do likewise. She may have been wealthy, but she wasn't above serving others with her time, with her acts of service, with her resources. And it's clear that some of the ministry of Paul and some of the ministry of others during that era was funded by her generosity. 
And I bring that up because I want us to ask ourselves the question, do we develop that same kind of heart as we walk with the Lord? Are we developing that? Is the Lord fostering that within us? Is that something we're even open to Him doing in our lives? Are we above serving others? Or do we accept, like Phoebe did, that we should never be above serving somebody else? She was somebody that could have been really snooty in her generation. And she chose not to be. Something else the Scripture points out that I think is worth noting, and it kind of gets me fired up when I read it. But here it shows us that it's probably a good idea that we risk our neck at least once in our life. Risk your neck. Does that sound like good or bad advice? Risk your neck at least once in your life. What is it? What are, why am I saying that? Well, look at what it says in verse 3. It says, greet Prisca. And by the way, Prisca is often referred to as Priscilla here. She's referred to as Prisca, but that's the same person. So it says, greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Epinatus, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. Let me pause there. Um, recently, very recently, I guess just a week and a half ago or so, I forced uh, most of my children to sit down with me and to watch a lengthy documentary about D-Day in World War II. That's what happens, by the way, when it's just me at home. And, uh, and then I discovered that there were... The, uh, my wife was gone, I forget where she was, uh, and I think uh, maybe Jay was gone too, he's probably at work. But the other three were home with me, and I was like, guys, and it was the day, it was the day after the anniversary of D-Day, and I said, I want you to watch something about D-Day and World War II. Now, I could tell when I brought that up that, that there wasn't like cheering in the house, you know, it wasn't like everybody was all excited about this idea of watching this documentary. Um, but by the end of the program, we had a very interesting discussion. And, and at least, unless they were faking me out, they seemed grateful to have heard some of the stories of the people that were referenced there. And one of the things that I think you'll notice almost universally about those who have been off to war together, when they tell their stories, and when they describe what it was like to experience, you know, just serving in perilous roles, just a perilous capacity, that the people that they served with, they, they form a powerful bond of friendship and a powerful bond of trust. When you're in the trenches with somebody, when you're risking your neck together, you develop friendship. And you develop trust. And as they were interviewing these individuals that served together, storming the beaches at, at, at Normandy, you know, on D-Day, people, you know, these interviews were done about 20 years ago. And so these guys were telling their story and they told the, about the affection that they had for those who served along with them. And that doesn't surprise me. And it doesn't surprise me that Paul would express affection for those who served along with him, including Aquila and Priscilla, who are referenced here, whom he describes as people who risked their necks. So Scripture tells us a few things about Priscilla and Aquila. They're very interesting people. I, they're like a power couple in the early church. We know they were fellow tent makers like the Apostle Paul. So that's what they would do as a trade. They would earn money by making tents. Paul actually met them in the city of Corinth. And while he was there, they actually invited Paul to come and live with them. So Paul lived with them for a period of time, and they worked alongside each other. So they were making tents together, serving together. Paul actually lived at their house. Scripture teaches that they also would host... So here we're gathered together in a, in a building that we collectively say, all right, this is a church building. This is a church meeting house. This is where church... Uh, worship takes place, right? Where we worship the Lord together as a church family. Well, during this first century of, of believers living during that period of time, they didn't own common property like that. So when the, the church would gather together, they would gather together in homes. And Priscilla and Aquila were people that had the gift of hospitality that would have a church meet right there in their home. 
We're also told that this couple was actively involved in teaching others. So they would teach, they would disciple, they would mentor others, particularly people that looked like they were going to be serving in some form of Christian leadership. They would take it upon themselves to mentor them. So this is a very giving group of people. I love what it tells us when we get to Acts chapter 18. When you look at Acts 18 verse 26, at that point they had met a guy named Apollos. And they heard Apollos speaking, and they could tell that Apollos was somebody who had a lot of potential, but there were a lot of things that he still needed kind of fine-tuned in his understanding of Scripture and his understanding of the Gospel. So politely, they brought Apollos aside and they said, you know, it says, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So they took Apollos aside and they explained the word of God to him more accurately so that he could understand the depths of the gospel, so that he could explain it with more clarity, so that he could be more effective as he was trying to serve other people. That's the kind of people they were. That's the kind of couple that they were. Priscilla and Aquila lived lives and demonstrated forms of hospitality that clearly display that as individuals and as a couple, they were committed to the cause of Christ. And based on what Paul says in this portion of Scripture, somewhere along the line, they apparently also risked their lives on, the, on behalf of the Apostle Paul. Now, we don't know the details of what they may have done. It doesn't tell us specifically. It just tells us that they did it. But in that era, you can imagine how difficult it was to be a Christian. Christians were often persecuted. Christians were arrested all the time. Christians were often executed just for boldly proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. And Paul obviously was making himself a target as he would go city to city, you know, place to place, emphatically teaching people of the necessity of receiving Jesus Christ to receive the gift of salvation. And Priscilla and Aquila must have done something like maybe, you know, sometimes I look at this and I think, all right, maybe they, maybe they hid Paul at one point when they found out people were going to try and kill him. Because there were people that regularly tried to kill the Apostle Paul. Uh, maybe they helped him escape some form of harm. Uh, maybe they offered him some form of protection that could have cost them their lives if they were exposed. Because keep in mind, for a period of time, Paul lived with them. So I'm picturing them maybe hiding him or protecting him or using the resources they had in some way to preserve his life. They did something like that for the sake of the Apostle Paul to save his life, and they risked their necks for him. And I have to say, I like people like that. I like people that would actually risk their neck for the benefit of somebody else. And when I read something like that, I'm, I'm trying not to read this chapter as just a listing of names of people that we might be somewhat curious about or maybe not curious about. But I look at that and I see two people here who risk their neck to save the life of somebody else. And it makes me ask this question of myself, and I'll, I'll just ask it of all of us. Do you ever think we go through life playing it way too safe? You know what I mean by that? Do you ever think we just go through life playing it way, way, way too safe? I have to tell you, when I look back over the course of my life, I could see an interesting pattern. My favorite moments in my personal highlight reel are not the many moments that I chose to play it safe. Those are the forgettable moments to me. You know, like I, that I just played it safe and just didn't take any risk or anything like that. The best moments, the moments that result in stories that get told or thoughts that come back to my mind or moments where I'm just driving my car and I'm thinking through things and maybe being a little bit introspective, the moments that come to my mind are the moments when I actually risked something. When I took a chance to be obedient to the Lord in an area that might cost me. So some of those moments... The moments that make me happiest when I look back over the course of my life maybe involved taking the risk to do something that I wasn't sure I was good at, but it needed to be done. So I took the risk and did it. Or there's a couple moments, and I got a high five from a distance. My wife sitting in the back, come on, go through the motions with me, high five me here, all right, because you're part of this. But there are a few moments where my gracious wife has allowed me to uproot our family completely. There's been several times we just uprooted completely to be obedient 
to serve the Lord. We wouldn't be here in Langhorn serving the Lord here if she wasn't cooperative with some of those things. There was a, a moment in time in 2008 where the Lord very clearly impressed upon my heart, you're supposed to uproot your family and you're supposed to move to Langhorn, you're supposed to serve there. Now, could you imagine having that conversation with your family? And to my wife's credit, she supported that. And it goes in the highlight reel, right? Sometimes those moments are, are, are just times where you take the risk to say something that you know you're saying a hard thing, but you're saying it in love for someone's benefit, but you also know that you're going to pay a price because you chose to speak up. So sometimes that can be the risk that you take. But I don't think the Lord's called us to go through life to just play it safe. I think sometimes we need to take the risk. I think sometimes we need to risk our necks. And here's the thing. And this is the kind of the question I ask myself when I see people like Priscilla and Aquila who just had a consistent faith that allowed them to just continue to do these things. But I say this, or I ask this, can we really say we're walking by faith and completely trusting in the Lord if we're never willing to risk our neck? Particular, particularly when he's saying, be obedient to me in this specific way. And if the habit of our life is always, no, Lord, I can't, that's not safe. No, Lord, I can't. That's not comfortable. No, Lord, that, that tests me in a way that I don't feel, I'm not ready yet to be tested in that area. Can we truly say we're walking by faith if our answer is always no when the Lord says, I want you to risk your neck and trust that I'm going to protect and provide for you? Priscilla and Aquila risked their necks to advance the gospel. Paul did as well. I hope that each of us get the chance to risk our neck at least once in our life. Something else that this portion of Scripture brings out that I want to point out, and that's this. Don't be afraid of hard work that pays you nothing. Look at this list of names here. Look at verse 6. It says, Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. And then it says, Greet Adronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles. And they were in Christ before me. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my kinsman Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet, the, greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Greet the, greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Do you see the theme as he's listing all these names, as he's talking about these people and referencing them. So even though the names you know, that Paul's listing here at the close of this letter are difficult to pronounce, I'm glad that he included them because it's clear that Paul valued these brothers and sisters in Christ. And in the midst of the thousands of people that Paul obviously spoke to and interacted with, he obviously remembered this group of people, this group of fellow workers, right? In this passage, he speaks of people like like this woman named Mary, somewhat common name during the time. It says here that she had worked hard for the church. That's her reputation. That's the only thing we know about her, that there was this woman named Mary in this context who worked hard for the church. That's her reputation that meets our ears. He speaks of, he speaks of uh, Andronicus and Junia, and he says that they were his fellow prisoners. So they were willing to go to prison because of their bold proclamation of Christ. He speaks of Urbanus, and he says Urbanus was his fellow worker in Christ. And then he lists the names of other people who were, who were great workers, who worked hard in the Lord. But what motivated their effort? Why did these people work? Did they do it for recognition? Did they do it because they knew that in 2,000 years, a church in Pennsylvania was going to be reading their names and that their names would get recorded in the Bible? Was that their motivation? Did they do it for compensation? No. They worked for the Lord's glory. That was their supreme motivation. That should be our motivation as well, to work for the Lord's glory. So since we walk in their steps, we should also be willing to work hard, even if there is not an earthly reward for the actions that we're taking. Don't be afraid to work hard, even if it pays you nothing. And one other portion of Scripture that I want to read for us today Verses 13 down to 16, and this is where we'll finish. 
But here you have the Apostle Paul encouraging us as believers to express our affection for our Christian family. Express your affection for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Let me reread these final verses that we're looking at today. But he says in verse 13, he says, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Isn't that a nice statement? Been a mother to me as well. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobas, Hermes, and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, uh, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Very grateful for the church that I had the privilege to grow up in, in the town of German, Pennsylvania, spelled with a J, J J-E-R-M-Y-N. Doesn't it almost sound like a parent trying to be trendy with how to spell your town? It's like, it used to be spelled a different way, but now we spell it like this, J-E-R-M-Y-N. I don't remember the history of how it got its name, but that's the name of the town, German, Pennsylvania. And uh, my home church is there. I'm very grateful for my home church and for the people that uh, truly were a blessing to me as I was growing up there. And in the church, there was a godly woman named Joyce. And I think I've probably mentioned her before because she certainly had an impact on me. Age-wise, she was older than my parents, but not quite as old as my grandparents. And she was just a godly, a godly woman in the church who would be a blessing to as many people as she could possibly be a blessing to. And she was one of the most affectionate people I ever met. Now, people show affection different ways. I tend to show affection through acts of service or words of encouragement. So that's how I tend to to tell somebody, hey, I appreciate you. Usually it's going to be through an act act of service or a word of encouragement. But that wasn't Joyce's way of showing affection. Joyce, and I kid you not, this is not an exaggeration. Before you left that church, or even when you first got to that church on a Sunday morning, when Joyce found you, you were going to get a kiss. Now, you could try and run, but she would find you. I don't know how she did it. Um, But no, she, I mean, she really did. And and she, she, like this, it was her way of saying, I am so glad you're here. And I'm so glad that you're part of our church family. And so, and I, it's funny, like when I was real little, I thought, oh no, this, this is like an extra aunt that I wasn't prepared for, right? But then as I grew older, I, I, as, and as I learned to appreciate uh, and could see what she was doing, I thought, this is wonderful. Like, this woman is one of the greatest blessings that this church has ever had. Just a godly woman that made it a point that while you were there, she wanted you to have it abundantly clear in your head. She was so glad to see you. She was so thankful that you were there and that you, specifically you, were loved. And if nobody else throughout the course of your week told you that, she was going to tell you that. That's a gift. And it was a blessing. And anytime I've gone back to visit the church, you know who I always look for? Joyce. Now again, I still, you don't have to look for her. She'll find you. But I always, always loved seeing her. And she really ministered to us. As Paul finishes up this section, what's he saying here? He understood that expressing affection... It's something that's important for believers in Jesus Christ. So he actually encourages it in these verses. And again, he names names here, and he encourages the church to greet one another while showing genuine affection and genuine appreciation. And I like to think that that's something that we're also taking time in our own way to show our church family, because it's, it's certainly wonderful to be on the receiving end of genuine love. When someone goes out of their way, however they choose to do it, to show you affection. Praise God for it, and thank Him for the love that you've just been shown. But reading through this portion of Scripture like like this, portion of Scripture that names a whole bunch of names, again, I I recognize that could often seem like a tedious task. And Again, sometimes we can even just result in skipping a passage like this altogether. But when I look at this, this is like, in a sense, reading our spiritual genealogy, isn't it? It's like reading about, you know, your great-grandparents and your great-great-grandparents. These were people who were in the family of God before us, who kind of like, like laid the path for us, 
who showed us what it looked like to walk with Christ in the midst of their generation. These are our spiritual parents. These are our spiritual brothers and sisters who lived during a different era. And so we don't want to skip their names as they're referenced here. But I'm also grateful that when we look at a portion of Scripture like this from God's Word, that we can be motivated by their example. And I think it's a portion of Scripture that certainly for me, and hopefully for you as well, motivates us to do big things. But as we're seeking to be obedient to the Lord, as we're motivated to do these big things, please notice that it's motivating us to do these big things, to be radically obedient to Christ, not as solo artists, but together. Together, united with our brothers and sisters in Christ, serving Christ together and glorifying His name in our generation. Let's pray. Lord, thank You so much for Your Word and for the privilege that You've given us to be able to look at a portion of Scripture like this and to just meditate on the things that You're revealing here. Lord, we're so grateful for these people that, that came before us. We know, Lord, that these are mostly names that have fallen out of common use, but some of these were common names during the time. And Lord, we're grateful to be able to spend a little time looking at them, not so much just because it gives us an opportunity to to see a little bit about who they were and what they did, but ultimately their example is pointing us to you. We're seeing what it looks like when you get a hold of a man's heart or when you get a hold of a woman's heart and you transform them and you give them a new perspective toward all things, toward their life, toward their wealth, toward their service, toward other people. You change their hearts, you change their lives, and you offer to do the same for us, Lord. And we're grateful for that. Lord Jesus, we're grateful that your word tells us that salvation is a matter of grace. You give it as a gift to those who trust in you by faith. And Lord, you know our hearts, you know our minds, you know what goes on in our lives. Lord, you know if there are those of us here this morning that just kind of know about you, but don't really know you. We've never experienced your power because maybe we don't have genuine faith in you. We pray, Lord, that you would completely change the heart of anyone that that might be the case today. Please change their heart and draw them unto yourself and help them to experience the power and the blessing that come to all those who trust in you, the forgiveness, the new life, the assurance of eternity, the understanding that our lives are being used for a great purpose that glorifies you. Lord, that's how you bless those who come to know you by faith. So I pray, Father, that each and every one of us today would have a strong and abiding trust in your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, for those of us who already know your Son, we pray that we would not be fearful to do big things, that we would not be fearful to risk our necks in radical obedience to you, Lord. We don't know what that's always going to look like. Sometimes it's just a matter of of just saying the right thing at the right time. Sometimes it's the matter of taking the risk to be kind to somebody that we know will not be kind back to us. Sometimes it's taking the risk to proclaim the truth of the gospel in a hostile environment. Lord, we see names in this portion of Scripture of those who actually went to prison because they chose to do so. And We even see that there were threats on Paul's life because he chose to do so. And we know that at the end of Paul's life, he was indeed executed because of his bold witness for you. So Lord, these are things that we learn. These are things that we see in this portion of Scripture. But we pray that by your grace, that they wouldn't fall on deaf ears or hard hearts. Lord, help us please as men and women to put you first in all matters and in all areas of our lives. And we're grateful that by your grace that you've united us together through our common faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, and that we have the privilege to be part of one another's lives and build each other up during this season in which you give us the privilege to serve. We commit ourselves to you now, Lord. We're grateful for the privilege to walk with you by faith. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Informal Bible Study. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, we'd invite you to stop by our website, which is desirejesus.com. And if you're not on our newsletter list, be sure to click the link to sign up right there on the front page of the website. But that's it for us today. Thanks again for listening. We hope you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. And we look forward to catching up with you again right here 
next Monday. Take care.